right, good morning, afternoon, and evening to you guys from all over the world, and it's always great to be here with you. And we've got a really exciting show for you. I am, as we say in California, I'm really stoked. So tell us where you're from. We always want to hear from you guys. We're going to take some questions later on, but let me do some introductions here. So first of all, for those who don't know who I am, I'm Mark Silver. I'm an author, photographer, and educator in Carmel, California. And this show is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo. Now, look, we're getting some specials here, 15% off on acrylic prints. And again, this is a great thing to do, print calendars and send them out to your friends make cards these are really easy ways to get your work out to the world which is super important as you know you hear me talking about it all the time and you can get 25 percent off on your first order so dive in there you guys okay well listen i'm excited to bring you our guest and let's have a look at some of her work while i'm introducing her so our guest today is Julia Fullerton Batten. Her hyper realism, as you can see in her images and cinematic styles are really characteristic. And we're gonna have a talk to see what goes on behind the scenes here. Um, they're often set in unexpectedly surreal settings and dramatic lighting, as you can see again, these are amazing images. They communicate both tension and mystery. Since becoming a professional photographer in 2005, she's accomplished 13 major projects. Her fine art work is globally renowned and exhibited, and she's won countless awards worldwide. She's frequently featured in photographic journals. She's published two books, and she's a Hasselblad ambassador and a frequent speaker in international workshops, and we are thrilled to have her on our show. Julia, welcome to Advancing Your Photography. It's so great to have you here. Thank you, Mark. That's a nice introduction. Thank you. <laughs> well, your work is amazing, and we definitely want to find out, like, what, how do you do this? I want to, I'm really interested in your process, your, you know, approach to lighting, but first of all, I always like to ask this one question. In terms of what drives you as a photographer, what is that? You know, what gets you out of bed and gets you to create these amazing images? Do you know what? I just love taking pictures. I just love having a camera, creating something that is in my head. Yeah. And then I... I tend to uh, set everything up. So everything is nearly pretty much staged. Now and then I did a project on the lockdown that was existing and photographing people through their windows. But a lot of it is staged. It's what I see in my head. And I spend a long time producing it, setting it up, creating it in my head. Yeah. And then the production. And I'm so excited when, because some of it takes such a long time, that I'm so excited when I actually do manage to get the camera out and take the picture as I, as I see it in my head. And that's what totally excites me. That's pretty amazing. So it really, you know, we talk about visualization as the starting point. Ansel Adams wrote about visualization over and over again, various different photographers, Edward Weston, how important it is to pre-visualize or visualize an image. And you you exemplify that. Obviously, you have to have totally pre-visualized this. And I'm going to ask you, maybe the best thing for us to do is just to dive in. And I'll, I'll have plenty of questions as we're looking through here. So, do you know what, Mark? If, if I could paint, I think I would be a painter. But I can't paint. But I just could never... I can do little stick men, so I decided to do photography in the end. Well, it's interesting you say that because I can see that quality in your work. I mean, this one that we're looking at, or was we were looking at a moment ago here, of the woman lying, you know, in in the creek with the flowers. I mean, that looks like a painting; could be a painting. But I'm going to jump over to and, your. And that one is actually copying a painting. I that is. I thought yeah. so. I kind of recognize it. 
is it well let, let's here's i've got your screen up with the um beach scene at the london bridge maybe you could just tell us about this and i know you have a series that's going to show us like how you develop this image i'm really curious about that so i i was doing a project it only completed about a year ago and it, the project itself lasted for about three years yeah. it was a project about um the river thames and when i was looking into the history of the river i realized that this is an area of london by the tower bridge that's very very famous yes but you this is now closed completely closed off to the public you can't even go down there until unless it's once a year and when people go mudlarking they open it once a year and people can go mudlarking at low tide which means they can go on the foreshore and look for artifacts and you can find 100 year old coins and it's really really fascinating that's called mudlarking mudlarking oh interesting yeah. okay never heard of that but this area so in the kind of from 1934 to about 1971 people obviously weren't traveling that much then as they are now right. and people used to go at low tide low tide down to the foreshore to sunbathe and swim and um hang out on the beach and they did actually import sand to this area on the foreshore so people were able to do this. So it would have actually looked like this scene? This is amazing. I had no idea. It would it actually be a beach scene like this? Yeah, so wow. I found this. Let me click to the next image yeah. if I can. That's because I've got some historical references, oh, yeah. which are original paintings from Getty Images. Sorry, original photographs. Yeah. That inspired me to do this photo shoot and I just thought it was such an interesting thing that happened that you just don't see you don't see people hanging out in the river I mean people do swim in the river now and then but that's quite unusual uh, yeah. but to be able to go there in front of this really iconic bridge and um, and sunbathe and hang out I just thought was so interesting that I thought I had to recreate this story so this is how I sometimes get my ideas uh-huh Kind of, um, I see something and research it, and then I take references from paintings or photographs that exist, and um, and then I recreate it how I see it. But I take references from, for example, the um, costumes, uh -huh. and I mean I love vintage kind of swimwear anyway. So I was very excited to to discover these images and then to kind of recreate it how I saw it. This is amazing. Now, how long, how long would it take you to move from that kind of discovery process where you're, you're looking and you something is inspiring you to where you actually have the finished photograph? What's what kind of time span are we looking at? Well, that's a little bit like how long is a piece of string? Because yeah. Often, I have to get the idea in my head to begin with, yeah. and then I have to sit on that idea before I actually start really concentrating and start working on it and researching. So it kind of depends on your question. If you were to involve the research stage or the production stage, because there's your cat. Let's take it for let, let's take it with this with this series with this photograph. What was the what was the research? part like how long did that take because i'm well i also i'm also a commercial photographer so i'm dipping in and out the whole time right okay so i i get sidetracked shooting my commissions which come up now and then and then i go back to producing a you know this image for example right so it's really hard it's really hard to answer that question to be honest okay the production the production side after i've really thought about what I want to create, I had to then get permission from the London Port Authority to actually go and for them to open the gates for me to actually go and photograph this from from this angle. Right. And, and itself takes a few weeks to, to get that approval. And then they set a date where I can go and I'm shooting the background. And then um, in the meantime, I'm, I'm, you know, finding my models, my actors, 
And then I'm working closely with the stylist who will be putting all the uh, costumes together. And I'm doing it as well because I'm a little bit obsessed with that. Okay. And then looking for props. And normally I try and shoot everything in camera, but I couldn't put, you know, 50 odd people in front of the Tower Bridge. They only let, gave me access for about half an hour to go and photograph there. And in fact, the first time I went there, I wasn't very happy with the with the sunlight. I wanted it to be quite a sunny day, but a little bit diffused. So I didn't want that really extreme, bright, hard shadow, which I got, but it's at a slight diffused, you know, slightly diffused look. Right. So once I had my background, I then created, spent three, four days and had to build a huge sand pit in a in a huge studio and bring every and create now creating sunlight as you probably know is quite hard it hard is. in in with, a studio yes could you go back in, could you bring you that image back up so as you're talking about it we can see the the uh the finish there we go so this was created in studio where the people it was are created, yes and it was really important that they're standing on sand so that their feet can integrate into the real sand yes. because if it their feet are just on the, you know, concrete surface. They wouldn't. It wouldn't feel like they're actually in the sand. Yeah. And yeah. then I spent sort of three days. Um, I spent a day lighting it with my crew, with my assistants, and then we spent two days um, shooting all the various people. Um, yeah. So it, so the shoot itself took three days. Okay. Um, plus the background, which took. Two, two days because I went back and then the research took maybe I don't know maybe on and off three four months okay it's really on and off it's not me concentrating it on yeah. it not off so That's it's, why it's, it's a fair, fairly long-term project really yeah yeah but the the, the whole um, old father Thames project took three years because there's about 15 probably 17 images in total and some of them are quite elaborate setups this was one of the more elaborate setups i see yeah well that's something i've been talking a lot about the value of having long-term projects as opposed to just you know individual images it develops it really develops your photography and it, it causes you to to think in terms of the end result of where you're going with those images rather than just one at a time and you know what, I really enjoy projects because you can really um, dig deep into yeah. the project. You know, you can really focus on it. And normally a project takes me about, probably about a year. But because the River Thames has so many, I mean, this, this project could be endless. And I, I might keep adding an image to it in the future because, because the only thing that's combining the project is actually just the river. Right. So it's very long open-ended project in a way because it could just go on forever and ever let's look at some more of your i'm i'm going back to that screen we've we've got okay this one tell us the story here baptism used to take place in the river thames uh -huh. where there was um, especially where there was no tide so the river is very tidal in in london but once you leave london and you go to a place called wiltshire um, it, it, it isn't tidal, and what I even though I'm recreating these scenes and there are historical kind of references, I try and find. I spend a long time finding the exact place where, for example, this baptism took place. Okay. I'm very excited to find this this part of the river where um, a baptism actually did take place, and um, if I can just share. This oh, is yeah. me, oh, me wow. and my small team in the water. And we had to traipse through the water, which took about 10 minutes to go to this exact spot. Amazing. Um, and bring everything in by little boats and kind of just wade through it. Luckily, it wasn't wasn't too too deep. But as you can see, I'm sat, I always um, shoot from a tripod. Um, the camera is static. So I'm treating it a little bit. I mean, it's not reportage at all. It's very kind of controlled and very very set up yes. and then once i've got my scene i then create the lights around around my subject matter and um 
place the people in the set. Um, and I create a little bit of a, a mist with a smoke machine that you can see that oh, kind yes. of in the distance. That might, You'll have two or three assistants running around in the background uh, creating that, that kind of look. And um, this is actually my reference that I that I found, oh, amazing. and that took place, which I just thought was so, so incredibly beautiful. These two, you know, a priest and someone else the guided this, there. Yeah. this beautiful girl into the water to be, to be baptized. Can we go back to your lighting setup? I'm really curious, and if you could walk us through this. First of all, are these all battery powered, or did you have to have a generator along with you? The, these are all batteries. Okay. So you've got, you've got the packs actually hanging yeah, on stands, which are also weighting the 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 stand down. Um, but you know everything just felt a little bit precarious. <laughs> That's amazing but, uh, to put that in the water. So okay, you've got the big soft box there, and then these are strobes, I assume, right up front there. Yeah, so okay. we've got a beauty okay. dish um, on on a on a mega boom, okay. which is which is above her, which is lighting lighting her from above. Okay, um, on a double wind up, and um, and then there are a couple of grids grids on the side that where I I I tend to spot quite a lot of things if I want to pick out, you know, his clothing or her face um, or something that's a bit too dark. And what you can't see is there's also lights on the side, on the right, behind her, that will be creating a hair light behind oh, her. Oh, interesting. Okay. We're not actually seeing all the lights that we, we put in the set. You're really controlling, and we mentioned, we talked about this yesterday, but you're really controlling all your lighting in camera on the set rather than um, doing, a, and it sounds like you can avoid a lot of post-production that way because you've really got it the way you want it. Yeah, I mean, I try and shoot everything in camera. Obviously, the um, Tower Bridge, I couldn't, uh, yeah. unfortunately. But I try and shoot everything and bring the surrealness with my lighting. I mean, people often say, hang on, the sun is coming from wherever on the right yeah. of the set. Why, why are you putting a light on the left to create the sun? But that's me creating that kind of slightly weird cinematic effect which i like let's go back so it, to the image itself what well, i want to see that now that i've i've got a better understanding of what you're doing with the lighting if you could uh bring that image bring the actual image back that would be fantastic oh the um the yeah, original there we go okay yeah now that okay so it's interesting to see it from behind the scenes and now go back to um yeah, and you have those clouds there, you have the smoke, you have all sorts of stuff, the reflections in the water. There's a lot of layers here. Very interesting. I, mean, I, took, I took another image of her immersed in the water, but but I preferred her preferred this one in the end. It's it's hard. I find the I find the editing bit super hard because I you come back with so many images and you know, there was one that was very, very um also very atmospheric, very dynamic, and at the end of the day, I've you know I sit on the images for a long, long time, keep going back, and I print them out and hang them on my wall, and just have to decide on 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 the one to tell that story in the end. You know, that's a let's talk about that for a minute because I think that's really important to have that time and not rush through the whole process of deciding which images you're going to keep. And, you know, that doesn't happen in a split second. Sometimes we can, you know, get so rushed about things that it, it's almost like it has to grow on you and you come back, right? So is that what happens? You kind of look at them. I like the way you print them and look at them and give them time to mature. Yeah, and also as, as a project is expanding, I keep, you know, the ones that I've, have already been completed, I hang them on the wall you know, they're just kind of A4 size, and I just blue tack them to my wall. Okay. And, um, and then I add the new ones and see how they work as a project. Um, no, I find the editing bit really, really hard. And because there's no deadline, there is no client, there's right. no rush, there's no rush to get the project out. I sit on it for a good, sometimes 
a month or two before I actually decide because I just got to keep going back to it and keep looking at it. And I find that that part also really, really important. And then you said, so are you doing a, a fairly simple printing? I mean, you're just using like the printer that you have behind you? Yeah, it's just printed okay. with my Epson printer. And, you know, they're not, it's, it is color calibrated, but it's not having it professionally printed. It's yeah. really just looking at it as, it's more about, I've shot it now. It's not that I can change anything about it. It's more what store, which image is telling the best story that right. I don't, need the most text I mean often I have to explain things with text and I think text does help but it'd be nice to also show the image without text and for people to see the image and go okay this obviously he's, he's he's holding the crucifix there's something religious happening here yeah she's in water they're you know they're wet he's you know there's something happening here that's religious. Hopefully people do read that it might be a baptism. Um, but to me, it's kind of, it's storytelling, isn't it? It's it is kind storytelling. Of, Absolutely. It is telling the best story. And that's, that's what I love. It's, it's, it's telling stories, which is what photography is really about. You know, and I just want to point out to our audience here, you guys, this is a really good point about prints. You know, you, you don't have to obsess over the, your final print. You could print a bunch of work prints, put them on the wall. I love anything that gets it off the digital platform because it's not how it's going to end up looking at the end of the day. But there is something... This is what we used to do back in the darkroom. We, we would make our test prints and and display them put you know t tack them up on the wall like you said until you saw the one that you really thought okay this is it and then you go for it you know Ansel Adams did that for sure he made all these test prints before he committed to the final version and i think that's really important and i remember it's only what 10 15 years ago where i, w I used to go and visit my printer and look at all the test prints yeah. and Go 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 through them all, and now you can was, just do it with your Epson and or whatever you're using. I think that's really important. Okay, let's go back to uh, let's go back and have a look at some more of your images. I love these stories. And by the way, I just want to underscore something. One of the things that I think during our lockdown that people could be emulating this even in their own home or apartment, you know, visualizing a photograph ahead of time and then setting it up right there in your space whether it's with your a few of your friends or family or whatever you know this this is something we all have access to and it it's important that we find ways to you know keep expanding as photographers and growing especially during this time period well i, I was going to show a different image but now you're mentioning lockdown <laughs> yeah why not I'm going to jump to this image, okay. um, which oh, yeah. I, sh I shot a project uh, titled Looking Out From Within in in lockdown. Um, it was when COVID hit, hit London and, you know, we were all confined in our in our own homes. We could only go out for an hour every day. I felt as a photographer, I had to do something about this. And... First, I was just photographing people randomly on the street because it was so unusual to see people wearing masks yeah, at that time. for sure. But then I've always loved the, the painter Edward Hopper, and I just love the picture within a picture frame, mm -hmm. you know, picture, picture yes. which is through looking through a window. And I thought, well, I remember photographing my young brother. Uh, we were in, uh, in France through a window, and I just loved, really loved just that the simplicity of the frame and he was within that frame. So I thought, well, I'm just going to photograph people through their windows because that's what I saw on these desolate streets around London in my area, in my local area. I would walk around the neighborhood and just see people looking out of their, out of their windows, nearly like they were in court in cages, you know, as if they were in a zoo. And oh, yeah. it, was, it was really surreal because there were some footages of animals suddenly playing in swimming pools or going out 
when people were inside. I don't know if you ever saw that, but there was some video footages all around the world of these animals just suddenly having a party outside. Yes, yes. Because people were suddenly <laughs> not driving cars. They weren't out on the streets, and these animals just kind of took over. Um, and so this was the first image that I created of uh, Chloe, which was lockdown day 19. And um, I took about 20, Im 20 different images of people through their windows. And this is me not, this is as far as I go with um, reportage, yeah. <laughs> as yeah. in it exists and, um, but I lit it and I created, I they are there in their homes, um, but I created in my own style, my kind of cinematic style of photography. Did you do any, was this, uh, this last one done with any particular lighting added to it, or was it just really artificial or natural light that you, that you had right there? Well, what I realized after doing quite a few, that the best time to shoot was at night when uh -huh. the ambient when the indoor um, lighting kind of takes over yeah. and um, giving it that kind of twilight feel. So I did light it, yeah. I probably had about four flash strobes. Okay, okay. That and... all outside. Actually, no, I did stick one in, in, the, um, in the bathroom that's coming through the window. I see amazing that we don't see any reflection you've done a really good job of placing those there's nothing bouncing off those windows which is remarkable i thought that'd be really hard but it's just finding the right angle and yeah. um and you know the great thing is with these lights is that you can put them on continuous lighting and you can see through the camera where where the light is not hitting and where it's not reflecting right right Okay, let's look at that. Yeah, oh, that's another lockdown shot, right? So th it is, yeah. So this one, I, um, apart from people approaching me and asking, because I put a little ad out in our in our local um, kind of uh, online platform, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I also prepare pre prepared letters, and if I found a house very interesting or a window. Obviously, I've never seen the the homeowners what they look what they look like. I had absolutely no idea, but I put a letter through the letterbox. Uh -huh. These are all my daily walks, saying, "You know, I'm doing. We're all stuck at home. We don't have much to do. I'm an art photographer. I really want to record this time in our lives. Um, I find your house very interesting. Do you want to? Can I photograph your home? It will take about half an hour or an hour." And uh, I probably posted about 20 letters. Um, only one person came came back saying, yes, I'm interested. And it was, at, this one's called Anne Lockdown Day 74. And it was Anne's husband who said, I love photography. Will you photograph me? And um, we set up the time. I pre-prepared, you know, often I go to the location beforehand and discuss with them how I'm going to shoot it. I look at my camera angle. Um, what they we look at the wardrobe. Um, I bring in my own plant that was homegrown because a lot of people were homegrowing their plants at that time. Yeah. Um, bring in any kind of reference of, you know, lockdown. And um, then his wife Anne. Well, I was going to photograph John and Anne together, which I did, but the window was too small. Mm-hmm wife looked very interesting I liked what she was wearing and she so I took different images and photographed her um, as well and that's one that I chose in the end but what the reason why I chose this house in particular is I love the empty this is a really busy road in London yeah um, it's hardly ever quiet but it was just nothing no one was going out it was just desolate just empty Looks like um, a country um, road, not 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 in the middle of London, you know. Especially because of the, what you have with the sky and the horizon there. I, I love that because it really looks like, this couldn't possibly be London. Well, you, we've got the River Thames on the on that side, and that's why you okay. don't see any other buildings. <laughs> I see. Yeah. 
I, and I love your mix of lights. You know, you've got the golden hour turning into the blue hour with, you know, the lights in the background and the lights inside. I mean, it's a wonderful mix of different kinds of light. And then there's the street light that is right. That that is oh, right. Yeah. There it is. Me. That's yeah. great. That kind of slightly surreal purple tinge. It does. Yes, indeed. With the shadows. You really do have, I can see your affinity for painting because that really, that could be a painting, you know, what you've done here. And you, and you do it so purposefully and your, your setup process is so exact that it really is the, you know, the visual of it is very much, I mean, for sure cinematic, but also it does seem like a painting that you're doing with your camera. Well, I, I take that as a compliment because I always like things to look quite painterly and absolutely. I really love color and, um, I spend a lot of time thinking about the background and what people are going to wear and what props and also what color palette. And I, I often remove things from the set. See, I call it a set. Yes. It's a set. It is a set for sure. Have but you photographed your cat, by the way? Do you, hmm? do you photograph your cat? Can you see the cat? Yeah, we can see your cat right over there. But is, I mean, have you used your cat as one of your subjects? No. Okay, just curious. Well, listen, why don't we take some questions? We can look at maybe some more examples uh, that relate to these questions. Jared, do you want to uh, read, yeah, read we've off got, a few of these? Yeah, we've got a couple. We've got several questions, actually. Um, we've got a couple that are related specifically to the Looking Out From Within uh, series. Uh, we've go. got Wayne... Ask, uh, what strobes are you using? So I've, Julie, I've gone back to the, uh, the next one, which is a houseboat, it looks like, with mm -hmm. uh, a woman with a bathing cap. So yeah. strobes. Yes, I was, I use uh, Profoto B1s. And um, I use probably three or four on this on this particular image, um, and they're all from outside looking in, um, lighting up certain parts of the boat that I want to enhance. I mean that light that is coming from that's pointing out is the natural light that she has actually in her in the boat. In the, itself interesting so often i would get the homeowners to you know move switch bring in all the lights they've got yeah. you know kind of just um you know like a standing light or anything that they've got put it in the room and bit by bit we would switch them on and off and place them in certain areas to create that kind of effect um but the um the strobes are you know lighting your face uh lighting bits of the boat um one of them was lighting that boat in the background. It was lighting up some of the water as well. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Huh. I think so. Those are those are very excellent strobes that I think everybody should have in their kit. And you know, what's also really looks great is the mix. Again, we were talking about the mix of light, that really warm light that that is just coming from the bulbs inside that boat right i mean that's the warmth it's just those tungsten yeah. lights and yeah. then you've got a lot of blue light in the background you know so that kind of contrast works really well i mean i often also bring diffuser and color gels and and play with that as well mm -hmm. uh, just to create another you know a slightly surreal look I would love to follow you around on one of your shoots just to see everything, all the tools that you're employing, because you are <laughs> you are definitely a master at that. OK, Jared, any other questions? All right. <laughs> so we seem to have lost Jared, but I see a few here. What camera? And Can you lens? hear me? Yeah, Can you hear here me we now? go. I'll just, read this, finish this. I this is you... from Hector. What camera and lenses are you using for the, your project and we know that you're a Hasselblad ambassador so but tell us what yeah. Yeah, what do you generally shoot with and what lenses like in this case what lens you're using I 
always like to shoot to works um, with um, a slightly wide angle lens. Right. Um, so something like a 40 mil lens. Yeah. Like just quite, even when I, fo when I photograph people, um, you know, quite close up, I quite like the surrealism of, I'm just wondering if I've got an example of that. Um, but I don't think I've got any close up, close ups. Well, I work with a, a Hasselblad, it's the H6D100C, and it's got an amazing uh, digital back. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, it's amazing quality. So when I actually exhibit the prints and print them quite large, you, you know, every single detail is really important um, that I create in the set. For example, these are created sets. Um, of sex workers, and I created these um, sets specifically to their lives and to their professions. Yeah. And having this um, digital um, back um, that is such good quality, really, you know, everything is, I can print it super large, and that's really, really important to me. Um, as I say, every, every single detail is just super important because it's brought in um i don't know if you can actually see this image at the moment but i brought in the bird yes we see uh, it what do you call it it's not bird poo is it just there's a word for bird poo <laughs> well i know there's bat guano i don't know i don't know what normal bird poop is called but we can go with poop <laughs> um so i you know i you have I, to import that I created this set. This was just an empty room, and I'm bringing in all the bird feed, the cages, uh -huh. birds, uh, the bird droppings, and that's really important um, for people to see that. And but you have a Hasselblad there, Mark. Yeah, I have a couple of them. This one, I have this one, which is the 501C, and then this one has just been loaned to me. This is the 907, and the this back will come off and go on to uh, the, the 501. But, you know, f in case you're not familiar with it, you're producing a very large file here. These these are, you know, film-wise, that would be a two and a quarter square. So that's, that's a lot of real estate, and we're capturing a lot of detail. And, um, you know, this is their newest model, which is different what, than what you're shooting with, but very similar, I would think. You know, it's got the back that flips out. You can kind of emulate the way you would shoot with this camera looking down into the into the viewfinder. See, I I love the looking down viewfinder because you cause you're shoot you're nearly shooting from the hip. Yeah. You know, then you know because so often people shoot at eye level and you have to crouch down. But right. if you if you've got the camera on, on the tripod and that you've got the down viewfinder, it's just beautiful to look through. I absolutely love it. And I've always, from day one, I've had a Hasselblad. It's just a, it's just a beautiful camera to, to work with. They are pieces of art. But you know what's cool with other cameras, since most cameras are now made with their LEDs that will flip out like this, you can do the same thing with almost any camera now, which I do like shooting especially when you're communicating to someone else you know if you do this <laughs> you're you're cutting yourself off from the person but if you're like the you know whether it's popped out and you're looking down you still re maintain that connection i think that's a really important point and yeah uh, i i do i agree with you i think you have much more control when you're when you're able to move that camera all over or even up high if you want, turn it upside down. Good. Well, why don't we take a few more questions, Jared? Are you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. There Can you, you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, we got a good question from Mike here. How do you instruct the models that you work with? Oh yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to pop back to one of your images here. Yeah. So we're in the chicken, the hen house. The, the, this is a this is a good example image because um, I'm cre recreating a story of a boy uh, called Sujit Kumar, who's the chicken boy, and he was discovered in Fiji in 1978. Wow! And it's a 
project on feral children, children who became feral through neglect and finding comfort through animals, so they become quite animal-like themselves. So I very carefully cast the right kind of people for each specific shoot. Mm-hmm. And this specific boy needed to look like he was from a certain origin. He needed to be look a little bit malnourished, not that he is, but he had to have these acting skills and ha- had to kind of, um, I had to tell him the story of this child that I'm trying to recreate. So when I'm actually doing the casting and he's coming to my, I don't have a studio, I work from home. He comes to my home, I'm asking him to act out this child that I'm trying to create. Interesting. Um, And that's really important. And um, if I see it in his eyes, in his, in his manners, then, then, I bring him in on the shoot, you know, then he's the right candidate. But it depends on each setup. I mean, I, when I did the project with sex workers, for example, and they're staging, I create these stages for them. I, I, didn't, I didn't have to instruct them at all. I don't, I'm, I'm not directing them. I'm just letting them play it out. But um, it depends. It depends yeah. on each setup. But the casting stage is super important to to meet the people in advance and to to see if they're the right candidate for the story that I'm trying to create. Fantastic. Let's take one last question. Yeah, I know exactly which question to do because uh, I'm interested in it now. as well. Yeah. So Carlos, uh, he, he's wondering, how do you get inspiration for your work? Do you actively look for stories or do you get ideas from what you see through time? So do you just kind of stumble on them or are you actively looking for these stories? That's a really interesting question. Um, before lockdown and that project on on lockdown, I was, for the first time ever, I just really had no ideas. I, I just thought, normally ideas just come into my head. Yeah. You know, it could be just me walking about, seeing something or something I've read a book I've read or if I've been to a gallery or, or a painting has inspired me and it just kind of comes flowing into my head. But before lockdown, I just had, uh, can you call it a writer's block? If, if it's photography, photographer's I don't know. block, I guess. Yeah. yeah photographer's block. <laughs> I really have no idea whatsoever. And I started just going mad in my head. Like, what am I going to create? And then I just thought, actually, for once, maybe I'm just not going to do anything. And then, and then we had lockdown and then it was shooting through the windows. It was nearly like, Mm -hmm. it was nearly as, I shouldn't say this, but it just opened up my mind to, to photograph and take the opportunity to photograph lockdown. Um, But normally I don't, I don't have that at all. And it can just be. As I say, it can be anything that just inspires me. and But I've got to sit on it for a long time because once I really get into this project, it's costly, it's time-consuming, yeah. um, it takes all my energy, um, it takes me away from the family. I have to really make sure that You're really that's committed. what I want to create. Yeah. So sit on the idea for a while before I before I do it, or I just shoot one image. For example, I'm just doing a project on contortionists, young female contortionists, and it's something I wanted to photograph for a while, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to make it a project. So I just shoot one girl and, or one day, and I've photographed three three different girls that day, and now I'm shooting my fourth day. So now I've got 12 images and it's turning into a project. So I think sometimes you don't really need to think, because if you think, oh my God, is this going to be a whole big project? I think a lot of photographers end up just shooting nothing right. or end up nothing. So I think taking it step by step is is okay too, to take, you know, do one day, photograph one subject, one one day, one one shot or two in that day, and then see if it works and it can be like a little mini test yes i think that's really good advice 
Well, listen, Julia, this has been fantastic. I wish we had more time and I, I, I wish I could follow you around on some of your shoots to see what actually goes on behind the curtain. But is there any final advice you'd like to leave our viewers with just to advance their photography and become better photographers? I, I would say have the confidence and believe believe in your own ideas. Yeah. Don't rack your brains too much. Don't don't be afraid. Have the you know find the confidence because I think many photographers have so many amazing ideas and they end up doing nothing. Spend the money on photography as in taking the pictures right wrong and um you know hire the gear rather than buying the gear you know don't spend all your money on just buying all the lighting hire it in and also sometimes you don't need all the lighting you know just because i use a lot of lighting it's the way i shoot but you know you can create amazing images with just natural light and just find your own voice and I remember when I was quite young and I just didn't know, I had no idea which direction I wanted to go and I didn't know if I wanted to do fashion. Still, I know I didn't want to do still life or food, but I just didn't know what I wanted to do. But I think you'll find your way by just taking pictures. Just take pictures. Take pictures for yourself. Yeah. And enter, enter competitions and just keep evolving and don't be afraid of making changes and we're learning look photographers are learning all the time i still don't know which direction i'm going in. i'm still learning all the time i'm still unsure and um you know sometimes i don't think there's ever you don't ever fail i think you're always learning all the time and just take pictures is what i say brilliant well listen thank you once again julia Thank it's you, Mark. Letting us inside your world as a photographer and um, stay safe and stay well there. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys. Fantastic. There's a lot we can learn from what she said. I'm gonna, I'm gonna really underscore some of those points um, probably on our next show. But fantastic. And you again, you guys can create these sets in your own home. Right. Or you can certainly do what she did, which is going out, uh, you know, and getting those window shots. So these things are available to you wherever you live. OK, well, just to wrap up a few things, uh, I didn't tell you guys earlier to subscribe and hit the hit the bell, ring the bell. So make sure you do that so you don't miss any of our shows. We've got a big week coming up big big week we're going to release ayp plus on wednesday stick around if you haven't answered our survey jared will you stick it in there i want some more answers from you guys because that's going to help me design ayp and especially roll out exactly what you guys are interested in learning super important um you know, in the United States, we have Thanksgiving coming up next week, which really signals the beginning of the holidays. I and mean, we're kind of already into it. But, uh, you know, this is it where we're hitting it. And there will be specials coming your way. But in the meantime, I would love it if you haven't already gotten a copy of Advancing Your Photography. Um Please do so. Here's my... I wrote my book, Advancing Your Photography, to give you a complete system to get inspired, learn composition, lighting, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I've got the ebook on sale right now. Go to advancingyourphotography.com. That morning. So uh, Jared can stick that in there too. And listen, you guys, just get out and photograph, just like she's saying, you know get inspired, find something, find a project. We're going to be specializing in these projects in AYP Plus and the Mark Silver Mentorship Program, which sounds like you guys like that name, so we're probably going to go with that. All right, Jared, anything else? I think I've covered all bases, right? Yeah, I think that pretty much covers everything. Keep your eye out for our stream next week we'll be, where we'll be launching AYP Plus. We're super excited. So We are really excited about that. That's going to give us a whole new level to work with you guys. All right. Well, listen, 
leave your comments, you know, like, share. I read your comments all the time and respond to them. Stay well, stay safe, and say it with me. Remember to get out and capture your own images of life. See you guys soon. Take care. Love you. Thank you.